Okay. So, now um, let us look at um, after the understanding of linguistics as a discipline and um, typology as a tool as I, as I just pointed out a while ago. My, I am using typology as a tool to understand linguistics as a discipline. So, in this connection, um, I am going to I am going to talk about what are the goals you might have or what are the goals you, you might set for yourself. I have my own course goals, but then you as a participant, um, what should be the goals that you want to set when you are trying to understand um, linguistics and you are trying to figure out how typology is going to work um, as a tool here. So, uh, let us have a look at it. Um, what should what is my goal for the course? I, I would like to help you with um, understanding of languages from a typological perspective or from a typological approach. So, you must study similarities and differences among languages. So, that is how or that is why we call it typology. So, typology is just not about the differences, it is also about the similarities. So, when you say a language X, Y, Z, they belong to type A and language A, B, C, they belong to type B. So, why do you put them, why do you put X, Y, Z in A category or in A type? That means, there must be some similarities. And when you say A, B, C set is different from X, Y, Z set, why do you put them in two different types? There must be some differences. So, primarily the focus of this particular course is going to highlight that similarity and differences, which is why we can claim that typologically language A and B, they are similar or typologically language A and X, they are different. So, uh, it may not, so one, the other thing that you must emphasize on when I highlight the similarities and then the differences among languages, these languages, let me let me put it in a more um, like let me put it in a clearer manner these languages may or may not stem from shared genetic relationship so you may not just like i gave you the example um, the let's say the indian languages or south asian languages for that matter if you compare um, an indo aryan language like hindi with a uh, tibeto burman language like maithilan they do not share a genetic relationship however they have some other relationship to share and that is what the aerial relationship because they are spoken in a linguistic area which is known as India or South Asia. So, uh, they, that is why my focus or I want to reiterate or I want to re-emphasize that uh, when I say typology, the languages that we are going to bring it on the table here, they may or may not stem from the shared, um, like they may not have a shared genetic relationship. They might not have any language contact, they might not have any anything um, similar as far as the environmental conditions are concerned. So, the language contact, language change and then the sharing language uh, or sharing genetic relationships, genealogical similarities, they may or may not occur um, when we compare the languages. So, keeping that in mind, I would like um, you to introduce a couple of research tools that typologists they deploy or the typologists they use to study this discipline. And uh, what are these tools? These are um, the first of its or one of the most important tools that the, that the typologists would use is the generalization. So, every time I generally what I do when I teach linguistics to my students here in IIT Madras in a regular class, um, I give them a lot of data and, and uh, it is a good thing that Indian classrooms are diversified all the time because we have speakers from Indo-Aryan, we have speakers from Dravidian, very few are from Tibeto Burman though I do not have many, but sometimes I get one or two. Um, and within the Indo-Aryan, we have multiple languages which are spoken. So, the, the most recent class that I was, um, that I was teaching. Uh, introduction to linguistics course, I had for Indo-Aryan, I had languages like I had speakers in the class um, who speak Indo-Aryan languages like Hindi, Gujarati, Marathi and Bangla. So, at least four Indo-Aryan languages and obviously, um, considering this institute is in Madras, we do get a lot of Dravidian language speakers. 
So then I definitely had um, speakers from Telugu, from Tamil, um, Kannada and Malayalam, all the four major Dravidian languages I had uh, participants in the course. Um, in Tibetan Bowman, um, I had generally I don't see many of them, but then I remember having one, at least one Tibetan Bowman scholar and then, sh and then he was um, a Bodo speaker. Bodo, which is spoken in Assam, and then this is uh, um, this is a Tibetan Bowman language. So, considering uh, my classroom is always diversified, I do throw like I do get a lot of data, and then people try to draw some generalization from the given data set that we have in hand. And the data set that we have in hand may not be exhaustive; they may not be they may not, may not be like huge, but then for sure that tiny set of data will also help you to draw some kind of typological generalization. So, on the basis of this generalization, we can, we can actually understand um, the nuances of languages in a better way. So, that is why I would say um, one, of the, one of the primary research tool that I want to introduce you to you or that I, that I would like you to like you that, that is my participants here to use is language typological generalizations. So, when you, whenever you get a set of data, try to find out what is the common thing about it, what is the commonality rather you, you encounter or you find in such a, um, such a, no matter how tiny the data set could be. So, focus on the generalizations. And then the second thing uh, or the second tool that I want you to be familiar with or to explore uh, things are um, like that is the different ways of constructing language samples. So, uh, you may have to collect some data um, during the course uh, to do the analysis. So, you should be able to construct certain, certain samples. So, let us say we are going to work on um, certain linguistic phenomenon called nominalization. So, you may ask me the question, what is nominalization? So, nominalization is the way by which a particular language creates or forms its nouns. So, how the nouns are formed in a particular language? To understand that phenomenon or to understand that concept, you need to work on language samples. And what are the language samples you might have? You as a native speaker of a particular language, you are one of the best informants for yourself. Besides that, you can also talk to other speakers in the surrounding. There is no fixed, um, let us say, sample size, but then the more is merrier. That is how we, we all um, understand. So, um, you should by through this course, whatever I am going to discuss related to language, linguistics and language typology, you should be able to construct some uh, like you should be able to construct some language samples and also use it as a research tool in this particular course. And uh, besides that, you should also be able to figure out um, the sources for obtaining language data. So, since I mentioned or I, I gave em emphasis or I put emphasis on um, language samples and then drawing generalizations, empirical data. So, you must be aware about what should be, um, what should be your reliable source when you are talking about, um, when you are talking about language data. Who is going to be your informant? and who you are going to talk to when or whether the data that you are going to collect, you want to put it in a written form or in a spoken form. That is a different story altogether. How to collect the data? Who should be your informant? And what are the demographic details that you want to, um, that, that you want to consider to collect the data? So, uh, these are small questions that you should keep in mind when you are trying to um, understand the sources or when you are going to figure out how to collect the data. I will share a couple of um, um, stories, what are the challenges you might encounter when you go for the data collection. Um, it may not be that exhaustive, it could be just a simple um, or, a, or a language that is spoken in your vicinity. You do not have to go to the field in that sense. So, you are um, let us say I am giving you my own example. I am a native uh, speaker of Odia, which is an, uh, which is an um, Eastern Indo-Aryan language, which 
it also has a lot of Dravidian features. That is how, uh, that is why we say that Odisha is the link between the Indo Aryan and the Dravidian culture. So, culturally, also we are like the hyphen, and then uh, we are also linguistic hyphen between north and south, like northern and the southern part of the country. So, if I want to work on um, certain linguistic phenomena in Odia, I may not have to uh, go to a diff like a far off place to collect data, but if I want to study the varieties that this language has, then I definitely need to get the samples from different places. But just if, if I do not want to um, focus on the varieties to begin my research with, which eventually um, might be needed later, but then uh, let us say I wanted to study passives. So, when I am trying to understand passives, I may not have to go into the varieties of passives or the varieties of languages that Odia has. Rather, I focused on my variety, which is spoken in this um, tiny uh, place called Bhadrak, which is, in, uh, which is um, on the eastern part of the state. So, um, I just considered one variety and that is what I considered as Odia. Odia definitely has multiple varieties and my Odia is one of them. So, in this case, I did not really go for um, data collection to the field uh, in that sense. Rather, what I did, I just talked to people um, in my surrounding, like in my family, friends, and then um, obviously, I did consider different generations, um, though we do not have uh, much difference as far as the generations are concerned um, in in understanding passives, I did not really find out any gender difference or, or like differ difference in speech as far as um, demographic details like gender is concerned or educational status is concerned or generation is concerned. So, I did not really focus much on that. For me, the these details, they did not, they were not that significant. Rather, I was trying to understand what I, what I was trying to figure out, how would they, um, consider a, a passive construction in Odia. So, that is the reason uh, and considering passives are not um, let us say much frequently used in the discourse, it was a little tricky for me to get the data. So, it depends what kind of linguistic or language phenomenon you want to study. If, if you want to study a function like nominalization, you might get a lot of data easily. But then again, if you want to focus on the spoken form like the natural conversation. So, then for passives, it was a little tricky for me. I could not really find much of passive constructions in the natural uh, conversational discourse. However, that does not mean that Odia does not have passives, it definitely has passives. So, what I did, I, I kind of thought about um, what could be the possible passive constructions and I asked my informants, do you think um, these constructions are okay with you? So, I as a native speaker, um, I try to figure out what, what could be the possible passive constructions in this language. So, once I um, understood, okay, these are the passives in my language, then I tried to test it or I gave the questionnaire to the informants with the, with a set of passive, possible passive constructions in Odia and I wanted them to let me know whether these are acceptable or unacceptable for them. Some people would find it extremely bad, then those would be unacceptable constructions. Some would find it okay, these are the acceptable ones and there are certain examples which would, um, which would be somewhere in the middle. Um, it is not that acceptable, but then sort of okay. So, I had three different, um, three different ways by which um, I can, I can sort of analyze my data. So, what I did, I did not consider the ones which are absolutely unacceptable, I am not, I am not going to go for it. And now, there are two, two other categories left, some passive constructions which are okay, some were not okay, but then sometimes they do use that. So, this is how I collected my data. But you may not have to follow this method all the time, you can simply um, go and do some recording of the natural conversation. And uh, these are the best data I would say, because no matter how much of structural research that you are doing, you are trying to understand the forms of language, eventually the real usage of language is tested in the discourse. So, uh, what kind of a discourse? It is a conversational discourse. Language survives with the speakers. 
So, if the speakers are not going to speak it, the language is going to die. So, uh, some people they try to or they, they work on conversational discourse and then they try to record some data that is also another way by which you can you can collect your data and um, when I when I if you look at the slides the so third point that we that we have here the sources so the sources of obtaining language data it's you as the um, as the investigator or as the as the researcher you have to figure out which source you are going to consider either you have a set of uh, let's say sentences or examples which will work as a questionnaire and you are going to test it with the native speakers. The other side of the story is that you do not really have a questionnaire in hand rather you are going to um, analyze some natural conversational data. So, how to get the natural conversation? You have to go for a recording otherwise it is not possible to analyze the data. So, you have to ask people to speak to each other maybe you can they can sit together in a group and then you are going to talk about it and you have got the recording done then you are going to transcribe and eventually you are going to analyze the data. So, that set of conversational discourse would would actually help you to give a lot of um, interesting data uh, for multiple linguistic phenomena because when we speak we actually um, we do have very interesting um, um, phenomenon that we that we encounter um, during the conversational discourse. So, that is going to be um, that is going to be your um, source for obtaining language data. So, uh, what my focus here as far as the, the goals of this particular course is concerned let us let me just sum it up uh, let us let me wind it up very quickly. So, I am going to do or I am going to ask you to understand generalizations. So, what are the generalizations? The typological generalizations. Once you have a set of data ready which I am going to give you the first set of data and eventually for the assignments you have got to do your own you have to go for your own data collection which could be very rudimentary it could be extremely um, basic do not worry about it this is this is also a basic level course or the fundamental level course. So, um, do collect some very basic data from your surrounding you do not have to go for a data collection to the field quote unquote in that sense just talk to people um, around you and then find out what kind of data that you can collect whether you are going to use a questionnaire or you are going to use the recording system but eventually you should be able to find out some typological generalization that your data has got to offer and once you are able to do that typological research becomes fun that is kind of um, I can assure you that when you try to analyze it or when you look at the data samples when you look at the language samples and then you got the empirical data in hand and that would actually in that that would trigger um, a lot of research questions or that would help you to figure out a lot of research questions to take it up further. So, um, these are a couple of things that I wanted to discuss as far as the goals of this particular course is concerned. So, primarily my focus is going to be on um, the language samples, generalizations and then the linguistic data. So, if you are able to do that um, by the end of this course then I would consider the course to be a successful one. So, um, with this I would move over to the different sub disciplines of linguistics in the next class. Um, until then you have to understand what like you have to remember what I discussed and then appreciate linguistics as much as you can and try to uh, try to understand how linguistics as a discipline is going to help you to, to sort of to understand human language better and human beings in a in a much better way or in a comprehensive or systematic manner. Thank you.